actually before I get to the 19th century, let me go back to the 1500s, right? Because I can easily prove there's a guy here called John Blank. John Blank was an African man. You can see an illustration of him. There's something called the Westminster Tournament Scroll, produced in 1511, and you can clearly see an African man playing a trumpet on a horse. This is in the period before the British get heavily involved in slavery and at this time there's a black presence not just in England but across Europe so we can find black people at some of the highest levels of society in uh, Switzerland, in Italy, in Spain and in England because this guy John Blank, he was a paid trumpeter who worked for two different kings. He worked for King Henry VII, he worked for King Henry VIII. So he, actually, he was actually part of the royal entourage at, I suppose, at some of the highest levels of society. Um, you can look at him. Then if you go to Germany, St. Maurice, going back 2,000 years, and the images of him from the 1560s is far removed from the idea that black people arrived in England or Europe in the 1948, because, you know, you can, you can, you can, and you can see this stuff for yourself, because there's a whole bunch of um, African images in European art in the 15, even 1600s, which show them as being noble, sophisticated, royal, good looking, smart, cool, smooth, I mean, which is the contrast to how you normally th um, experience in the black image at that time, or in the 1800s, because you s normally see black people in the past shown as slaves, half naked, on their knees, blah, 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 blah. That's, that's the normal experience. But when you see these images, it obviously shows you that there was a different treatment, perception, and reality for those African people who were living here 500, 400, 600 years ago. Uh, another person I'd suggest to kind of check out um, this is in the 1800s now. It's a guy called Prince Alamayo. Prince Alamayo, he was brought here from Ethiopia in 1868, about seven years old. So basically, the British went to Ethiopia, mashed up this town called Magdala, and even though his mum was still alive, they said they were going to adopt him or either bring him back to England for some reason, right? So he's brought back to England as a seven year old kid, and then Queen Victoria adopts him. He becomes part of the royal entourage again. Um, and actually, he, he has family back in Ethiopia. They're writing letters saying, please come home, please come home. He's actually saying to the British, I want to go home, I want to go home. They refuse to send him home. And eventually, after about 10 years or so, he actually dies of a broken heart. He dies of depression. Um, and you can see images of him in the National Portrait Gallery. They show him in um, some European clothes, looking kind of quite smart. He's only a little boy, or young, young man, actually. Um, but you can see, that he, even when in the pictures, you can see that he's got sadness behind his eyes because the man wants to go back to his home, but he's been refused. And actually, well, you could even argue he was a political prisoner because the man, the boy, wanted to go home, he had family back home, but the British wouldn't let him go home. You think about 1948, right, and I can prove there's been black people here, not just even here, but actually part of the royal entourage, 1868. Another really interesting figure is a woman called Princess Sarah Bonetta, B-O-N-E-T-T-A. And she was an African child who became part of Queen Victoria's entourage again. Um, and you can see pictures of, if you Google it, she's actually part of the National Portrait Gallery's kind of um, exhibits, uh, the images she has anyway. So you can see a picture of her because her story is amazing because she grew up as part again of the royal entourage and then she gets married to a rich Nigerian guy. And they just look so cool, so wealthy, so aristocratic, so, you know, just so well dressed and so impressive, right? And this is pictures from the 1860s or something like that. So it's like a photographic document of the black presence in England long before Windrush. And these people were, I mean, like I said, that Nigerian guy was a wealthy guy. They got married, went to live in Brighton, had a big kind of wedding down there. And that's the history. So it's all true, it's all factual. So the question then is, how come when they're doing Victorians at school, which they do do, they don't mention her or him? Because the pictures are there. National Portrait Gallery, you can actually go and see it for yourself. Actually, you can see it online more often than in an actual um, display, but it's there. So these references are there. Um, you've got a couple of names already. I'll give you one more. You can check out Princess Sophie Dulip Singh. Dulip is D-U-L-E-E-P and Singh is S-A-N-G. Now because her story is amazing because she's connected to a, an Indian prince who's the heir to the Kuhnar diamond. The Kuhnar diamond at the time was one of the biggest diamonds in the world and that diamond happened to end up in the crown jewels, right? Um, but Maharaja Dulip Singh got married to an Ethiopian woman called Bamba Muller. So Bamba Muller was from Ethiopia, or part Ethiopian, and she got married to this uh, Indian king, or heir to a foreign in India, in the Punjab actually, and they had a child, or had six children actually, and one of them was called Princess Sophie Dulip Singh, and she became a suffragette. So 
there's an African connection. If you put her name in, you can actually see a picture of her because she was campaigning for equal rights for women back in the 1900s. So amazing story, especially when you look at her dad. Um, but, and also it links into wealth because that Kuhnar diamond is priceless. And guess what? The Indian government has actually asked for it back. The British government says, no, we can't give it back to you for some odd reason.